and lust for less. <laughs> All right, remember, I don't use a microphone, so whatever that means to you. All right. I have a confession to make. Oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Stick around, you'll hear a lot of Hey, Rick, that was the altar call a minute ago. <laughs> so last, um, are we ready? Ready. Last week we talked about ologies, eschatology, pneumology, and then we talked about the ology that is the study or the science of sin. And sin is basically defined as missing the mark, which I absolutely did last week. It's not archaeology, it's archaeology. So I will give you handouts that contain some of the major ologies that we will be referencing in class. Okay, I heard from at least one person last week that I give out too much homework. <laughs> Good me. Too bad, so sad. I tried really hard, but I couldn't cry about it. So here comes your second hand up. Y'all are going to have to pay attention now because we got six of these to get through today. Wow. All right. This is the infamous hermeneutic handout. Uh, Someone will be using throughout our study today. We should have plenty of copies here. Yeah. <laughs> the etymology is certainly uh, relevant right now. When you're done passing them out, okay, are you all ready? Ready. When you're done passing them out, just leave the extras back there, okay? Take them home. Okay. You're welcome.
period where the canon of Scripture, in my opinion, based on what I've read in the Bible, is closed. There is therefore now no continuing revelation from God. God has revealed what He will reveal. It's in the pages of your book. So what we are involved in today is illumination. And will God open the ears of our understanding so that we might be illuminated as to what he has told us already. Okay? The Bible is presented below in a chiastic structure. Don't let that word, don't let that word scare you. Like it did me. <laughs> But if you look at the little diagram on your on your paper, you will see that the Bible is laid out. And how you read this is you read it from top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom. And so the first the first part of your diagram is God's history of the past. It starts where the heavens and earth are created. In the center of the diagram. You have God's revelation of the future, and you drop down to the very bottom to number one where it says the new heavens and the new earth. Go back to the top of number two, Satan's first rebellion. Go to the bottom, number two, Satan's final rebellion. Do you see how this is being laid out for you? This is how the Bible is structured for you and me. On the top, number three, earth is prepared for man. On the bottom, number three, earth is perfected for man. Amen. Okay? All right, so this is a chiastic structure. There are many, there are many things that are, that are presented in this format. But here is the encapsulation of the 66 books of the Bible for you. So what begins in Revelation, what begins in Genesis, and I've taught that book once. <laughs> There's 50 chapters in that one, so you can imagine how long that, that, that took. But, but everything that begins in Genesis is summarized or ended, or, 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 or the, the cap is put on it in Revelation. All right? Okay. We've already talked about the golden rule of interpretation. Unless the text very clearly indicates that we are dealing with a type. Do we all know what a type is? Way to go, Margo. <laughs> <laughs> all right, hold on. Oh, man. Written up. Yep. On the list. <laughs> Don't make me put a check next Don't get a check next to your neighbor. <laughs> I don't know if you heard, Rick, but I know how to get in. Oh. <laughs> I only do that because we've known each other. <laughs> okay. Does everybody know what a type is? T-Y-P-E, -E, Jerry. You know what a type is? Now you might want to listen. <laughs> yeah. So a type is a picture as seen darkly through a glass that portends something real later on. For example, one of my favorite passages of scripture is chapter 22 of Genesis whereby Abraham as a type of God the Father offers his son Isaac as a type of God the Son who later in chapter 24 issues a mandate to his servant Eleazar to go find a bride for his son. Eleazar means comforter. Oh my goodness. Now you read chapter 22 and you find out that Isaac carried the wood 
up the hill, that the location that Abraham was sent to was the same location where Jesus Christ was later crucified. Oh. Now I can I can spend all morning and next Sunday on Genesis chapter 22. The typology is staggering. So a type is a picture of what is coming. I warn you about types, however, that at some point within the type, it falls apart. Because after all, it's just a picture. Okay? All right. What is what do we call the fulfillment of a type? Uh, this is gonna this is gonna knock the wheels off your cart. It's called an anti-type. <laughs> oh Doesn't make sense to me, but that's what it's called. So the anti-type of Abraham is God the Father. The anti-type of Isaac is Jesus the Christ. Okay. So the fulfillment of a type is an anti-type. As far as I know, outside possibly the book of Revelation, because it is, after all, a book of what? Very good. Let's try that again. A book of what? Prophecy. Very good. Possibly, with the exception of Revelation, every type I know of is in the Old Testament. Why? Because the antitypes are in the New Testament, by and large. Not always. Okay. We talked about the first mention principle. And there are some examples there for you. And that's that. If you have trouble sleeping tonight, I would suggest you break this out. <laughs> As I told you, it was a book that thick in Bible school. All semester long how to interpret the Bible. Now what's the first step? Read it. Read the book. Right? I have three. I have three, right? And some of you may know this. Some of you have been exposed to this. I have three steps for success. Three steps for success. And I would suggest you write them down. There may or may not be a test later on. Oh, oh, oh. oh, I love tests. Oh, I know it. Step number one. Are you ready? Yes. Read the book. You wrote it down already? Good for you. You ready for number two? Yes. Read the book. You ready for number three? Yeah. Read the book. Read the book. It's amazing what that will do for you. I don't understand it. It's hard to understand. I don't get it. Welcome to the club. <laughs> That's true. But as I was speaking with somebody earlier in, in, in the class today, it really, it's nice if you understand it, but it really doesn't matter in this regard. If you've hidden it here, the Holy Spirit will use it. It's there for the Holy Spirit's use. It's not, it's not there so that we can impress each other with, hey, how many Bible how many Bible verses do you memorize? I don't know. What is phenomenal, though, is that when you're engaged in a conversation with somebody, isn't it amazing how the Spirit will pull that verse out of nowhere mm -hmm. yep. and yep. give it to you? Yep. Yep. He didn't pull it out of nowhere, folks. He went to the filing cabinet of your heart, <clears throat> under the letter A, in the file folder labeled Anger, and look to see if you put anything there because that was what was required at the moment. And if there's nothing there, guess what you get? Nothing. You're on your own. Oh. <laughs> okay. All right, I am a huge believer in context. Context without context is pretext. I live by that. And therein is grace. <laughs> Even though you deserve that. I guess it would be mercy, wouldn't it? Okay. Pop quiz. 
For those of you who have had this quiz before, please be quiet. For those of you who haven't, <laughs> This is a one word pop quiz. And all you have to do is tell me what it says. Raise your hand. What, do you, what, what does it say? Wrong. You're wrong. Oh, now it says red? You're wrong. Either way, you're wrong. Why? Because you don't have any context. All right. If I write, <laughs> now, what does that say? It says read. That's right. <laughs> Smarty pants, whoever you are. <laughs> <laughs> now, what does it say? <laughs> right. Without context, you are ill equipped to tell anybody what that word says. And it's just one word. Wow. One simple word, and you can't get it right without context. This is how important context is. Now here's the bad news. Where is the context of the New Testament? Great so. All right, <coughs> yep. So how's that saying go? Isn't it on the back of this thing? Oh, it's probably in my notes. The Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. The New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament. Okay. All right. Prophecy means intelligible preaching. I <laughs> hope. 1 Corinthians 14 is your reference for that, and I hope that's the case in the class here. You guys will be the judge of that. Okay, handout number three. Quickly followed by handout number four. <laughs> now, Dave, I heard nothing but complaining from your table because they were last to get the hand out. Oh, okay. Okay, I'll give it What you have before you are a list of titles used up or used of and or by Jesus Christ. You guys doing okay up here? Oh. Oh. So what you have before you is a handout of the titles that have been used of Jesus just in Revelation. Those are all found just in Revelation. Now I will give you a handout that contains over 255 titles for Jesus Christ found in the book. And I do not claim this to be an exhaustive list. We serve an amazing Savior. I got it at my disposal. <laughs> On demand. <laughs> he belongs to me. I didn't know. How are we doing? Okay. Yeah. Is that my wife talking? <laughs> On the board. On the board. Oh, yeah. I was explaining that you belong to me. 
Oh. <laughs> Somebody didn't know that. <laughs> 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 Janet, don't you know if anybody you explain, then you get your name on the boards. <laughs> if anybody do else doesn't know this, I'm her. I'm her lesser half. <laughs> We've been introduced to people at the church who knew her and knew me, but didn't know we were we. <laughs> when I was introduced as her husband, I've heard, I've seen them literally go, oh. I've known you forever, but I didn't know. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Many, many years ago, God looked at me and went, oh, this is going to take somebody special. <laughs> Hey, in July we will celebrate 35 years of marriage. That's, that's her fault. I gave her every opportunity to run screaming for the hills. 45. Is that extra? Okay, are we ready? All right. Y'all take those handouts home. Don't try to read them here in class. We got things to do. All right. Are we all in agreement as to who the author is? Who authored our book? John the Apostle. John the Beloved. I can give you four or five pages of reasons why that's the case if you need them. <laughs> when was the book written? Somewhere between 95 and 96 AD. It was not written before the ransacking of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That would make it a book of history, not a book of prophecy. So that's the author, that's the date. Again, we can bury we can bury ourselves in arguments and and, and 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 if you think I'm kidding, I have two four inch loose leaf notebooks filled with pages of notes for this class. All you all you see here is the, introdu <laughs> the introductory stuff, folks. <laughs> So if you want, if you want the arguments for why, we can certainly go through that. Yeah. <clears throat> but I don't think there will be but three of you left if we do that. <laughs> John's concern in writing this book is twofold. The internal conditions of the church and the external threats by which they face. And some of those external th threats are within the church. And we'll read about that. Jews who are not Jews. Why seven churches? Seven postal reasons. We covered that last week, did we not? Okay. Okie dokie. Hey, we got through that section. How many letters to how many churches? Seven. Seven. Funny that. Imagine how many letters to churches Paul wrote. Go ahead, guess. Seven. And they align themselves to some degree or another with the seven letters that Christ wrote to his seven churches. And we'll make those correlations. It is said of the Spirit in John 16, 14 that he will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. In the Old Testament, we see Christ in prophecy. Summarized by the statement, Behold, he comes. In the Gospels, we see Christ in history. Summarized by the statement, Behold, he dies. In the Acts of the Apostles, we see Christ in the church. Behold, he lives. The epistles, 
Christ had experienced. Behold, he saves. And in the, and in the apocalypse, Christ in coming glory, behold, he reigns. <clears throat> it's a message of the Holy Spirit to us. Okay. Doing all right so far? Okay. The Old Testament is an account of a nation. Which nation? Okay. That's fine. You leave out two previous generations, but that's okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> The nation was not Israel until Jacob. Until oh, Jacob wrestled yeah. with God at Peniel. Right. And God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Israel. You can call them, you can call them, you can call them Israel. Call them the Jews. The Jews was a derogatory remark, or a, a derogatory term. And I think that didn't come until the New Testament. family of Jacob family of Abraham you know Abraham had more Gentile children than he had Jewish children he had six Gentile sons and Ishmael is not counted at all the Holy Spirit does not count Ishmael it says it says in chapter 22 of Genesis, and this is another thing that I love, because this points directly to John 3.16, which we are all aware of. God said to Abraham, take your son, your only son, in whom you love, to a place I will show you. To do what? There, crucify him. And Abraham figured that God would have to raise Isaac from the dead in the book of Galatians I think it is makes this statement figuratively speaking that's exactly what he did raised him from the dead Abraham was referred to as a Hebrew even before God chose him to be the father of the nation of Israel if you will called him out of the Gentile nation Ur of the Chaldees it was a pagan nation it was an idol worshipping nation and yet he was referred to as a Hebrew so in my for my two cents the fact that he was a Hebrew is indicative of his spiritual heritage that he got from his great great grandfather Heber The fact that he was a Jew is his national heritage. If you read the book of Romans, you're going to find out that the national heritage is valuable. But not every Israelite, not every Jew is a Jew. So, but Paul says, Paul being a Jew among Jews, that's what Paul says in the book of Romans. We're not teaching Romans, but that was free. <laughs> so the Old Testament is a story of a nation. The New Testament is a story of a man. Yes, what?
Why? Because those two words mean different things. And the difference between Abram and Abraham and Sarai and Sarah is the addition of the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is the letter H in English. What do we know about the number five? Are we not alone? It, it is indicative of restoration. Redemption. It is indicative of redemption. Isn't it odd, don't you think, that there were women included in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? Look here. That was not the custom to include women in genealogies. In fact, we didn't even count women when it came time to count for censuses. When Jesus fed the 5,000, wrong. Jesus fed the 20 to 25,000 because that was 5,000 men of fighting age. And you had the women, you had the children, you had the, you had the old guys who couldn't fight, you had the younger guys who were too young to fight. That's only 5,000 men. But don't you think it's odd that within the ge genealogy of Jesus Christ there are women? I do. How many women do you think? Oh, very good. Very good. Five women. You know who they were? Ruth. What was Ruth? A Moabite. Who? Who else? Esther. Rahab. Rahab. What was she? Probably. <laughs> Who else? Tamar. Tamar. What was she? Teacher's pet. She's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Tamar. <laughs> she was involved in an incestuous relationship with her father-in-law, Judah. Okay. Wow, we're batting a thousand here so far, aren't we? Who else? Some of you will want to say Bathsheba. Although that was her name, that is not how the Bible lists her in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. You know how she's listed in that genealogy? As the wife of Uriah. Yeah. Just in case we forget, she was the wife of Uriah. Uriah being one of David's mighty men. That's like messing around with your best friend's wife. Getting her pregnant and then finding a way to kill him to cover up the sin. This is David, a man after God's own heart. Wow. Well, that's four. Who's five? Mary. 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 Mary's the only one we can put on public TV. <laughs> well, not anymore, but you know. <laughs> Five women listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Okay, we covered the four different, as I know them, methods of interpreting this book. And I subscribe to the futuristic. So, what you're going to get from me is a pre-tribulation rapture of the church and a pre-millennial returning of the king to set up his earthly kingdom which will last on the earth for a thousand years that's what you're going to get from me you don't agree if you have a different position i have a problem with you and i hope you don't have a problem with me but I will tell you why I believe these alternate views of the tribulation have surfaced. You want that now? Sure. So <clears throat> it's called replacement theology, and it comes out of covenant, this, this thing called covenant theology, whereby. According to them, God is done with Israel and has replaced Israel with the church. 
Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, I don't have my phone. So, I think it's 1 Corinthians 10, 27. Somebody look that up for me. 1 Corinthians 10, 27, or thereabouts. I hope that's right. If not, Hamardiology. <laughs> Missed the mark again. Anybody got that? Yeah, that's not it. <laughs> nice, nice try, though, huh? First Corinthians. First Corinthians. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is it Second Corinthians ten thirteen twenty seven? Basically, what it says is the Apostle Paul admonishes us not to give offense to three different kinds of people. The Jew, the Gentile, and the church. So, there are Jews, Gentiles, and all y'all. The church. The neithers. I call them the neithers. Because we're neither male nor female. We're neither Jew nor Gentile. We're neither slave nor free. members of Christ's church which the Apostle Paul describes he, he apolit, 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 what is the word I'm trying to say? <laughs> apolit, apolipsis? No, no, no. Apocalypse reveals us to be the bride of Christ. 10 what? 1032. First or second? First Corinthians 1032. Thank you. Okay. 10.32, what book? Yeah, that works. Okay, good, thank you. God is not done with Israel. God has not replaced Israel. And so, if you do replace Israel with the church, then you have to come up with some, some methodology to have the church either go through or not go through tribulation or part of the tribulation why part of the tribulation I don't know the only thing that happens in the middle of the tribulation that I know is the abomination of desolation and the death of the two witnesses I don't know how, I don't know how they make that work I also I also hold to a pre tribulation rapture of the church because I'm a coward <laughs> I'd like out of here, please. You will also find, what did I tell you? Rebecca? Chapter 3, verse 23, to chapter 22, verse 13 or something. No mention of the church. The church is mentioned here, and the church is mentioned there, and it's not mentioned in between. Now, we do not have a verse in our Bible that says, people, pay attention. Jesus is coming before. To rapture the church before the tribulation. We don't have that verse. Wish we did. But I'll give you a half a dozen, a dozen, 18 different reasons why I believe in a pre tribulation rapture of the bride of Christ. Okay? Doesn't mean I'm right, but I'm happy to listen to, you, to anybody else's 18 arguments for a pre or a post or mid tribulation rapture. Pre-millennium. It is, you know, there were eight. There were eight that I know of. Eight covenants that God made with people on this planet. The Adamic, the Edenic, the Noahic. Great. Then we start with the Abrahamic covenant. We have the Mosaic covenant. We have the Palestinian covenant. We have the Davidic covenant. We have the new covenant. Those five covenants were made by God with the nation of Israel. The new covenant was not made with the church. 
Jeremiah 31, 31 is a reference for the new covenant. Does that sound like the New Testament to y'all? Doesn't to me either. Jeremiah 31, 31, 31. Thank you. We Gentiles are the recipients of God's blessing because of the nation of Israel. You don't buy that? Look up Matthew 15. Read Matthew 15, where Jesus tells the woman that comes to him, I have come only to save the house of Israel. Oh, what do you do with that? And it is improper to give the children's food to the dogs. What was she, uh, Canaanite? The Canaanite woman says, yes, Lord, that even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table. And he said, your faith has made you whole. We have been grafted in. We have been grafted in. When Israel as a nation said, we will not have this man rule over us, Jesus invited the Gentiles. The Bible very clearly says to make the Jews jealous. That happened in Matthew chapter 12. From Matthew chapter 13 on, Jesus spoke only in parables. It was partly a judgment against the nation of Israel. Okay. So that was my position. You ready for the next handout? Yep. The Old Testament the New Covenant. Ah, okay. Good for you. Good for you. In the New Testament, it talks about a new covenant, but I would like to hear the new covenant. Amen. Okay, so you, may, you bring up a very good point. God says, if you do this, I'll do that. If you do this, I'll do that. Did I get that right? Yeah. Okay. Say it again, Thank you. Thank you. If you haven't figured it out by now, I'm hard of hearing. That doesn't do me well at home. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right. Of the five covenants that God made with the nation of Israel, four are unconditional and eternal. One is conditional and has a termination date. All right, how do you tell the difference? When you're reading the verbiage of a covenant and it says, if you do this, then I will do that. That's conditional language. You only find that in the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant is the only one that was conditional. It's the only one that has ended. When did it end? With the death of Jesus. Very good. All right. The other four. That's not God. God? Yeah. The other four are unconditional. Right? For example, the Abrahamic covenant. How was that portrayed? It was portrayed by the dividing of animals. And half the animal was here and half the animal was there. And customarily, both parties of the agreement would walk between the severed animals, symbolizing, may this happen to us if we break the covenant. If I break the covenant with you, then I'm expecting to be rent in twain. That was the symbology. When God made that covenant with Abraham, where was Abraham? Asleep. Who walked through the pieces? 
God. That flaming jar or whatever that thing was. So who was responsible for that covenant? God. So the verbiage, the verbiage that you'll see is I will, I will, I will. Jeremiah 31, 31. I will remove the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. You will not need a teacher. I will be your teacher. You read that passage of scripture and you see the many blessings that are ours as a New Testament church. We are recipients of the blessings of that new covenant that God made with the nation of Israel. Does that help? Yes? Okay. All right. Okay. Next handout. We doing okay? Yes, I can. You want all eight? A damn a uh, dam, a dam, a Adams. Thank you. Edenic, Eden. No egg, Noah. What was the covenant he made with Noah, for example? Hey, yeah. Hey, but pay attention because God's got a sense of humor. He promised never to destroy the the earth by water and he put a rainbow in the sky yeah is he going to destroy the earth again yes but not by water by fire okay now the five covenants that he made with Israel are you ready okay. the Abrahamic covenant Mosaic covenant. This is one that many of us don't know about. The Palestinian covenant. Yep, I understand that. The Davidic covenant. And we've talked about the new covenant. The Davidic covenant. This is an unconditional, eternal covenant that God made with the people of Israel. And what did he promise? a physical king on a physical throne ruling a physical kingdom. How about that? So a post-millennial position does not fly in the face of the Davidic covenant. And certainly a spiritual millennial kingdom as, as proposed by the amillennials certainly does not fly in the face of the unconditional covenant God made with David. Okay? So this is why what you're going to get from me is a physical kingdom with a physical king on physical earth ruling physical people. How? With a rod of iron. I certainly can. Sure. Whenever somebody talks to you about the tribulation, they're referencing the rapture of the church. I'll get I'll get right to you. Tribulation equals rapture. When we talk about the millennial kingdom, we're talking about the return of Jesus Christ. I remember last week we said that the second coming of Jesus is not the rapture. We will hear the trumpets and we will meet him in the air. He does not come to earth. The second advent of Jesus Christ is the second coming to earth. When does that occur? At the Battle of Armageddon. He's riding a white horse and we are with him. How did we get there? Because uh, we got jerked out of here quite a while. Skip. What was the new covenant? Yeah, he would remove the stone of heart. 
give us the stone of flesh. It speaks of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You read Jeremiah 31, you'll get more of the details. Okay. But this is, this is what... This is a lot of what we deal with today as a New Testament church. So what were the fourth and fifth covenant? Davidic and new. Okay, here's your next handout. While you're passing this out, I can answer questions. I hear a lot of I hear a lot of jabbering going. What are your questions? Yes. Physical throne. There's a physical king. Physical king. Okay, are we doing all right? Anybody else got a question while we're talking? Yeah. Sorry? Beginning. The covenant he made in Egypt. It's in our computer. Yes. The Edenic covenant. In case anybody else is interested. The Edenic covenant has, has to do with the sacrifice of an innocent. Yes. Hey, folks. I got my pen out. I'm going to put names on the board here. The Edenic Covenant had to do, it introduced the idea of a substitutionary death, the innocent for the guilty. It, it also made, God also made it very clear that religion is unacceptable. Religion is defined as man's attempt to make himself presentable to a holy God and it does not work. We see that in the fig leaves. Adam realized he was naked. He realized he was no longer covered. He realized he was no longer under the covenant of God and tried to rectify that with a fig leaf. Like we try to rectify that with church attendance. Or throwing our offering in the plate. Yeah. Or all kinds of other stuff that we do. And God says, no. And so part of the Edenic covenant was to introduce the idea that only God covers. So that's the difference between religion and in a relationship. Yeah, yeah. The substitutionary death that was heralded as a type. The first type I know of in, in, in the Bible is Genesis chapter 3. The first messianic type is in chapter 3 of Genesis. Oh, hey, right? You will crush his head or bruise his heel. That's, that speaks to the crucifixion. Where Lucifer thought he had won. When Christ was nailed to the cross and gave up his spirit, Lucifer thought he had won. Ha! Our Savior returned from Hades with the keys to death and hell. Victorious. We'll see this again in Revelation. We'll see, God refers to them as my, possessive, my two witnesses. Does anybody know who or what God's two witnesses are? The law and the prophets. 
the law via Moses and the prophets via Elijah. Really? Huh. Now we got the Mount of Transfiguration. We got Jesus Christ and who else? Moses. Moses and Elijah. Huh. In the book of Revelation, God is going to assign two witnesses for the first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation. Who might they be? Elijah and Moses. Elijah and Moses. Does it say that? No. But it does say that they will be able to shut up the sky for three and a half years and it will not rain. Huh. Who else did that? Elijah. Elijah. They they will they will be able to uh, terrorize all of mankind with every kind of plague. Who does that sound like? Moses. Fire will come from their mouths to destroy their their opponents. Who did that? Hey, that's one of the coolest stories in the Old Testament. Elijah. Elijah's up on a hill, and the king wants wants him so he sends a guard with 50 soldiers he says go get that guy and bring him here and the guard stands at the bottom of the hill and says Elijah get yourself down here the king wants you <coughs> oh what happened fire from heaven 51 crispy critters at the bottom of the hill <laughs> when they didn't show up the king sent another guard and 50 more guys and said go get him go get that pain in my backside and bring him to me and they showed up and they said, Elijah, get yourself on down here. The king wants to see you. What happened? Right, 102 crispy critters at the bottom of the hill. The king sends yet a third guy. How'd you like to be that third guy? <laughs> he takes his 50 soldiers to the bottom of the hill and he says, sir, Elijah, sir, if it's convenient, and if you have a moment, the king is requesting your presence only if you have a moment yeah so these two witnesses in the book of Revelation exhibit all of these characteristics and abilities are they named Moses and Elijah no are they I believe that after three and a half years the beast is given power to kill them and he does so and he kills them right in the street of Jerusalem and in an Old Testament, Old East, Eastern, ancient Eastern insult was not to bury the dead. Leave them where they lay. Let the crows have them. Which is exactly what they did with God's witnesses. For three days, those two guys lay deader than a doornail in the streets of Jerusalem. And the people of the earth rejoiced. Finally, those two thorns in our flesh are gone. Ha! Three days later, the breath of God was breathed into them. They stood up, shook off the dust, and ascended. <laughs> this is cool stuff. This is cool stuff. Okay, your your uh, last handout talks to you about the heptatic structure of the book of Revelation. There are sevens. There are a multitude of sevens. Yep. Say again? I don't. I don't. I appreciate I appreciate that. Enoch, Enoch was one of the few people that was raptured, taken up to God, did not die. Elijah was another. Moses died, but who buried him? God buried him. Why? So that the knucklehead Jews wouldn't dig him up and make a shrine out of him. Right. Right. Yeah. Or, so our adversary didn't get a hold of his bones and do something worse. But Enoch, I see none of these characteristics from Enoch. And Enoch was not at the transfiguration. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when you get to that, there's some guys who died more than once. How'd you like to be that guy? <laughs> there it was, minding my own business, laying in the tomb, sneaking things up, and I heard a voice say, come. So I got up and I came. 
<laughs> right? John 11, I think it is. Only what? To die again. I bet the second trip wasn't as scary as the first one. <laughs> hey, this looks familiar. I've been here before. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about the seven, then I just wanted to say that there are actually 52 times seven is used in the Bible. What? Yeah. 52 <laughs> times seven is used seven in the Bible? Seven is used 52 times in the Bible. Yeah. And then you can multiply that by seven. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Okay, pop quiz. My mind works this way. I'm sorry, I was a child of the 60s. <laughs> Some of you might know what that means. <laughs> hey, if somebody says they remember the 60s, they weren't there. Height would age. Okay. Pop quiz. When was the first time the Trinity was mentioned in the Bible? If you've heard this before, shoosh. When was the first time the Trinity... Is the word Trinity used in the Bible? No. 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 Is the word rapture used in the Bible? No. Ah, uh, trick question, trick question. It is rapture. If you read the Latin Vulgate, yes, it is. Oh. That's where the term comes from, rapturo. It's Latin. The word in Greek that you and I will discuss at length is harpazo. Harpazo. A jerking out of. Like some of us are pausos. Jerk that thing out. The Trinity is first mentioned in the fourth word of the first chapter of the first verse. In the beginning, God. The word in Hebrew is Elohim. Elohim. This is worth a minute. Elohim. Wherever you find E-L in a word, especially in a Hebrew word, it is God. Daniel. God is my judge. Michael. The fire of God. Okay? I am. Makes this plural. We got some we got some we got some teachers in here. What is the word in English? What is what does plural mean? More than one. More than one. Wrong answer. <laughs> one point five is more than one. Three or more. When I went to school, plural was explained to me this way two or more. Okay? Not more than one. Not more than one. Two or more. In Hebrew, you have singular, you have dual. And you have plural. Singular meaning what? One. Very good. Very good. Dual meaning what? Two. 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 Plural meaning what? Three or more. Three or more. In the beginning, Elohim, the triune Godhead, created the heavens and the earth. Okay. We are almost done with our uh, introductory stuff. We can probably start chapter one next week. In the first few verses of chapter one, it is revealed to God, it is revealed to John, what was, what is, and what is to come. Okay.
If you if you do not now, you will before we're done. Start looking for patterns. The Jews are really excited about the patterns. What is? What was? What is to come? relative to our salvation. Now, when I ask you a question, you might want to pause and figure out what I'm really asking. Are we free? There's a good one. Are we free? As believers, come on, people. Yes. Are we free? No. Hey, the Bible says you're either a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. How's free work into that? Are we free? Yes. <laughs> Romans 8, Romans 8, what is it, Romans 8, 8, 1, is it Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, are we free, yes, free from what, condemnation, free from what, the second death, free from what, the wrath of God, are we free, no, we are hidden in the beloved, We've been grafted into the tree. We're citizens of heaven. Are we free? No. Do you want to be free? No. I do not ever want to be free from my Lord and Savior. I do not ever want to be uncovered as Adam was in the garden. Never. In it that is, respect, I never want to be free. It is a one. Thank you. Romans 8 1. Thank you. Your salvation. Here's another one of those questions. I'm almost done, Dave. Okay. Here's another one of those questions. Are you saved? What is he really asking? The answer is yes and no. I have been. I have been. I have been, past tense, I have been, we have been saved, done deal, from the penalty of sin. NLT, Romans 8, 1. I am being, is, I am being saved from the power of sin. Is that complete? No. How do you know? Because not a one of you will make it through the day without sinning. Ain't that the truth? All right? I know her because I know me. And we're cut from the same cloth as all, all y'all. So this has not been completed, has it? No. Will it? Yes. When? Not until the 22nd chapter of Revelation. When there will be no more curse. Oh, we're free from this when we tr when we're translated to heaven by death or by rapture. But this will stop being a problem for mankind. Twenty second chapter of Revelation it is to come. That will be saved from the very presence of sin. That's a three part three three-part aspect of our salvation. I have been, I am in the process of, and I will be. As we all are. That was free. There's no charge for that. <laughs> okay. I'm done. We'll pass out one more handout. And you're good. Yeah. That was good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.